Genesis chapter 33. I'm excited about this message. Last week's message, I really, really was ministered to by that message. The Lord really, really touched my heart. I don't know if you got ministered by it, but I know I got ministered by it. The Holy Spirit really ministered to me. And the same is true tonight as we go through chapter 33. The Lord has really ministered to me. Uh, This whole relationship with Jacob and his wives and Laban, and now we're going to see tonight with with his brother Esau, now is um, just been really interesting to me. Uh, it, It just has brought so much illumination to my own life and my own situations and the things that are going on in the world today going on with Calvary Chapel so um, I'm excited about it God is good and he's always doing a work so tonight's theme is equitable restoration what a neat word huh equitable and and I chose that word specifically and I'll define it for you Uh, what it means is uh is when two parties agree to disagree and yet work together in peace. And as I thought about that, isn't that really every relationship we have? No matter how close it is or distant it is, we have to learn to disagree agreeably and yet still work together in peace. It really, really is true. In all of my years, I found that there is no perfect relationship. I have not seen a perfect relationship. I used to have a a friend, and he would always tell me that, oh, no, our, perf- our relationship's perfect. Uh, we never fight. We never argue. We have no problems. And then down the road, you realize that they had major problems. <laughs> you know, there is no relationship that is perfect. I found men and women who were able or unable to have equitable relationships. Some have parted their ways, and there have been few who have understood their roles within the body of Christ and have been able to work together graciously. And it works that way, really, when you, when you really think about it. It really does, that you're able to work together equitably. Three points tonight. One, relationships. I'm going to talk about what is a relationship. And I think that's important because I don't know if we know what a relationship really is. And then I'm going to talk about being able to agree and disagree (laughs) agreeably. And then lastly, be at peace, at peace with the situation and the relationship. In this chapter, let me give you the context. We find Jacob and Esau finally experiencing restoration. They are both at peace with one another and therefore live in peace with each other. They have not seen each other for over 21 years. And now the Lord has brought them back together. If you remember, the Lord told Jacob, go back to your land, to the land of Abraham, your father. And so the Lord is pushing him that way. And now he's going to meet his brother Esau tonight. Let's go ahead and start with verses 1 through 7 as Jacob and his family meet Esau. Now you have the context last week of Jacob sending, remember he sent the groups to uh, Esau to to soften his heart with, with gifts and so forth and then he was going to be at the end so he gives us some details here where he changes that a little bit. Uh, Jacob has been wrestling with God, we saw that last week. In verse 30, it, it, uh, Jacob um, called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So he had this encounter, this, this connection, this change that just drastically changed his whole perspective and direction in life. Because he encountered God, he saw God face to face. In verse 1, it says, Jacob lifted his eyes and he saw Esau was coming and he was coming with 400 men so he divided his children among them Leah Rachel and the two maidservants so after wrestling with God Jacob had the confidence that God would keep his promises to Abraham and now to Jacob it, he changed it the, the the divisions instead of sending them and then his family being last he switched it around where he would be first and then his family, and then the rest. That shows confidence that now he has a faith and a trust in God. So he approaches Esau cautiously, but yet 
he approaches in faith. Now, there's a Psalms 27.3 that says, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. And it's in the Lord that we have our confidence. No matter what is going on around us, no matter what trial or sufferings we may have, we have the confidence that God is with us, that he never leaves us or forsake us, and he'll give us the strength. In verse 2, it says he put his maidservants, their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and then Rachel and Joseph, and then he was last. He crossed over and bowed before him, that is Esau, seven times to the ground until he came near to his brother. Notice the change in Jacob here. As he approaches Esau, he walks in front of the groups. The day before, he was carefully organizing the groups. And now it's changed to where he has the confidence to face Esau face to face. And so he precedes them, and then he starts to bow to the ground seven times. There's been archaeology discoveries of that period that tell us that when you approach a king, you are to bow seven times before that king. And by this, Jacob is acknowledging Esau as a lord, giving him that respect. This is the way that they would do it. You would approach the king from a distance. You would bow down straight, parallel with the, with the ground, and you would have your eyes on them, and then you'd walk forward again and do that seven times until you came right up to them and bowed the last time. And this is exactly the position that Jacob was in <clears throat> towards his brother Esau. Now it's interesting because Jacob took this position even though Isaac, Isaac's blessing had said the opposite. We heard in 27, 29, Isaac's blessing upon Jacob was, let the people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. That's what it said. But Jacob takes the position of humility here, even though he had the right to have Esau bow down to him. So verse 4, Esau ran, he met him, embraced him, he fell on his neck, he kissed him, and he wept. So the enmity between these two for 20 years in a moment just disappeared. You ever have one of those encounters where, where you had enmity with someone? And, and after a, a certain amount of time, they say time heals, you're able to not talk about the situation, but able to forget the situation and come together and just hug and kiss it seemed like they just began to love on one another we would probably say right as they both just gave a big big hug brotherly affection proverbs 21 21 says the king's heart is in the hand of the lord like the rivers of water he turns it wherever he wishes wow the king's heart is in the hand of the lord he's the one that can turn hearts he can soften them or he can harden them like Pharaoh. And in this case, he softened the hearts of Jacob and Esau. God has a way of touching the hearts of men and softening them towards one another. What changed Esau? Could it be that he saw the reflection of God in Jacob's face because Jacob had seen God face to face? Did it change him that much that he began to show the glory of God like Moses when he came down from the Mount of Sinai? I think there's some evidence to that when you look at verse 10. Interesting. Verse 5 says, Esau lifted his eyes and he saw the women, the children, and said, Who are these? And Jacob says, The children whom God has graciously given to your servant. God has blessed me, brother, with these beautiful children notice that he's not crafty he's not being deceitful he's just being very honest and gracious about it all something's going on here with jacob he's changed he's calling him servant verse five we'll see in verse eight he calls him lord in verse uh five again he he refers to the children as the gracious gift that god has given to them i mean jacob has softened and God has done a great work in his life. 
So the maidservants came near with their children and they bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near and they bowed down, verse 7. Probably at a signal from Jacob that they came near and they presented themselves to, to Esau. So we see this wonderful relationship just being reunited again. Well, what is a relationship? I think we all have a certain definition of what a relationship is, but what is a biblical relationship? We want to know what God has defined for us that a relationship should be. In both the Testaments, the idea of friend or friendship involves three parts. It imparts association, a part of loyalty, and also affection. Three parts. There's an association, and we all have associations. There's also a loyalty that comes with some of those associations, and then there also is affection. There are also three levels of meanings here, as friendship, as association only. Um, You may have an association, a person you know probably at work, or if you go to school, a fellow student that, that is there with you, Uh, maybe at some of your children's school, a a mother or even a father. And there are associations, right? And you just know them and you're cordial with them. You know, you're kind, you're compassionate. You don't really have coffee or much like that. You have something in common. And then there's that friendship uh, of association, that loyalty, where there's something more than than just association. You, You connect, you click. And now you you have a certain loyalty uh, to that individual. Uh, Maybe you feel indebted. Maybe they feel indebted to you. You have a commonality, which should be Christ. You know, maybe the same ideas, the same thoughts uh, on their uh, different views of what's going on in the world. But you have a loyalty to them. You'll even protect them at times. And friendship as association plus loyalty adds affection. And that's where affection comes in, where our emotions are stirred for the person and that we actually love that person. We care about that person. Paul expresses this loyalty and affection relationship when he refers to several individuals with the language of family love. He speaks of Timothy and Titus as true children. And, And that is association and loyalty and affection. These are my children. I've poured into them. I've loved them as though they were my very own. And to Timothy as a dear son. And I treated him as a son. And I encouraged him and I have so much hope for him as a son. Yet they weren't blood related. Yet they had a relationship. Onesimus is not only Paul's son, but he said his very heart. Wow, that is affection. His very heart. You know, there's, there, there's a man that I could probably say within this church that I am definitely associated, loyal, and affectionate to. And you probably already know who it is. And that's Randy. I just, I, I just love that guy. I love him. Is it because he supports me? It could be. Maybe we are like-minded maybe he's able to work through things and and encourage me but we talk all the time we text each other Uh, we have a relationship with one another and I just am connected to that individual and I thank God for him this last weekend they um he he texted me say we're coming home for the weekend he was all excited because they thought they'd be gone for the whole month and I said praise God because I am sick and I don't know if I can do Saturday morning so I'm just like, God, you are so good how you set things up. And he came right in and took over. And just took, took over the men's breakfast. And I love the fact that God sets this up between me and him. And that's, I think, I love more than anything else. An unnamed woman in the Roman church is mother literally to a Christian named Rufus and figuratively to Paul considered a mother. That's a relationship. Making lifelong friends is rare in today's culture, isn't it? And due to many factors, for one, we are moving addresses all the time. People just seem to not stay in one place, so it's hard to create 
you know, loyalty and affections. You might have associations. But even when we stay in one place a long time, uh, the fast-paced life doesn't allow uh, that creation either. I've noticed that in our society. <clears throat> used to be a time when the boys were very, very little. Virginia and I, we knew all the neighbors. We'd go over to the neighbors. They'd come over our house. We had relationships right there in the neighborhood. We moved here years later, and it just seemed like that wasn't the, the case as much. And even more so, we've, we've known, we had lived right across the street from a family and we never even met them for years, for years and years. Fast-paced life, face social media. It may, it may help us connect and associate with people, even old classmates and distant relatives, but it also poses an ele ele electronic barrier to the kinds of practices most necessary for deep relationships it doesn't allow for that because you can quickly just say a few words and then you're off and you're going and you think you're having a relationship but it's the connection with one another that really makes that relationship there's just something about touching <clears throat> it's a difficult thing to do but have you ever touched your friend Esau and Jacob they hugged each other they kissed each other they weeped with each other there's a connection that's made there when you touch someone. There really is. If we ever had need of wisdom regarding friendship, I think it's now. And what we need is biblical relationships. The book of Proverbs has a few things to say about relationships. It's wise to have good Christian friends. Listen to what Proverbs says. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men is, will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. So when you choose friends, you want to choose wise friends. Very wise friends. Not friends that will tear you down or, or help you tear others down. When, a relation, when the relationship is deep and respectful, it will survive adversities. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. There's a friend that loves at all times, no matter what. There, uh, love covers a multitudes of sin. Maybe that's why I love Randy so much. He overlooks my sins. And love does that. When you love someone, you don't look at the sin in their lives. Because, guys, we're all sinners, are we not? We all fall short of the glory of God. And we don't all do things the same way. If we want to have a relationship with a friend... We got to be friendly, right? You have to be friendly too. I don't have friends. Well, have you ever thought about going out and being friendly to someone and getting friends? Because you play a big part in it. Proverbs eighteen twenty four: A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I think that's speaking of Jesus Christ. That even if you don't have friends, there's a friend that's closer than even a brother. And that's Jesus himself. If you want to be a good friend or want a friend, it will take time and work, definitely. It will take time and work. It really will. You'll need grace. You'll need mercy and forgiveness for one another in that friendship. And lastly, choose a godly friend. A godly friend. One that really loves the Lord. You know, we're, we're to choose our spouse the same way. You choose a spouse that loves God more than you. You really do, because then you know they're going to love you, according to the Bible. And so choose your friends the same way. Choose friends that love God with all their hearts, and you'll have a good friend. <coughs> we move on in verse 8 through 11 as there's an explanation about these gifts that Jacob was giving his brother Esau. Verse 8 there, Esau said, what do you mean by all, the, all this company which I met? And Jacob said, these are to find favor, my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep what you have. And Jacob said, no, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, verse 10, then receive my present from my hand as much as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. And you were pleased with me. Please take my blessings that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. 
So Esau basically questioned these droves that were coming towards him with all of these gifts. And Jacob just basically said, look, these are my children. The Lord has blessed me with plenty. And I'd like to just give you more because I'm sure you're blessed too. And it's interesting that the two words there, enough, that are used are interesting words. Esau uses the word enough about pertaining to his riches. And he uses the Hebrew word rub, which is R-A-B. And it is talking about just having um, everything that he needs. I'm sorry, not everything that he needs. But just having... Just having resources is what the word means. Where Jacob uses the word kol, C-O-L. And in the Hebrew, that means having everything. And so there's a difference where Esau's materials are enough for him, where Jacob says, I have everything I ever need. And what he's talking about here, he's talking about the resources that God has given to him, that he can have faith in God, that God will give him everything that he needs in life. And that's the difference. <clears throat> verse 12 through 17, the voyage continues on home for Jacob. Look at verse 12. And Esau said, let us... Take our journey home and I will go before you. So here he offers to take Jacob to his home there in Seir uh, <clears throat> as an escort. <clears throat> and so he's suggesting, let me, let me be your protection. Let me guide you. Let you just follow me and we'll get you there. Um, but Jacob wisely i think declined it look at verse 13 he said my lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me and if the men should drive them hard one day all the flock will die so jacob's having a i think a reasonable excuse here for the tiredness of, of his camp and so forth to move forward but he's also using some wisdom he doesn't want to go back to seer he's being cautious Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant Jacob, and I will lead on slowly so the livestock and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. It would seem that Jacob is still a little unsure about Esau here. He's hesitant to go with him to Seir, especially since God told him to go back to your father's land and not to Seir, which is more south of where the Lord wanted him to go. And so he's being obedient to God, yet being cautious with his brother. He wants to take the slower pace and go with his animals and his, his children who are weary and so forth uh, <clears throat> at a much slower place to where God told him to go. And so Esau said to him, verse 15, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But Jacob says, no, said to him, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day to seer so he finally accepted and said okay go go ahead and, and take your time i'll go back to home so jacob journeyed to sackcloth built himself a house and made booths for his livestock therefore the name of the place is called sackcloth now this is the first time that the hebrews literally built a house out of stone or mud whatever they used at that time uh, a place of stationary calling itself homes they have lived in tents up to this time and i made a point this morning how that was so unbiblical some thought because god doesn't want us to be attached to this world he wants us to be detached from it we are sojourners the bible says we're passing through and so we should not get too connected uh, to this world or the things of this world. We should hold on to them very loosely. And it seems like he was holding on to it a little bit longer than he should have been. And God's going to move him in a second here. So Jacob must have felt greatly relieved at the reconciliation with him and, and, and Esau. However, he did not want to get any closer in that association. Uh, whether it was painful memories or maybe even thinking that, that possibly they might resurface. And so I think it's wise that we still kind of keep our distance at this time. You know, and sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. You've got to give people some time. And so my next point, agree to disagree agreeably. You know, a good friend will always 
A good friendship will be tested in time. Every friendship will be tested. I, I don't care who you are and how great your friendship is, it will be tested in time, always will. Every friendship that I have had in the 55 years, okay, so let's say 50 because I'm at least five years old and I understood what a friendship was, have always been tested with some of the closest friends that I've ever had. And some of them have been their mistakes, some of them have been my mistakes, okay? Most of them have been my mistakes. You know, I'm not a friendly guy, I guess, but... They've all been tested. Even in the strongest of relationships, there will be times when small disagreements can cause mountains to grow out of molehills. So it's important to keep striving for better communication with one another. The term agree to disagree or agreeing to disagree is a phrase in English referring to the resolution of conflict usually a debate or a quarrel, whereby all parties tolerate but do not accept the opposing position. That's something we need to understand, that we don't have to agree on everything. We can learn to agree disagreeably. Walter Martin taught me that. He would all talking with people. He's saying, well, I, I, I disagree with you, and we can disagree to disagree agreeably thank you very much next caller you know <laughs> that was walter martin and I, and i learned from him that i don't have to agree with everybody and i don't have to confront them on what they believe either because in time like virginia always reminds me in a hundred years is it going to matter and do we value the relationship more than we do the fact that we might be right or or we might be wrong too <clears throat> and learning to disagree agreeably is wonderful and we have a right to our beliefs and what we think is right because what one man person thinks is correct another man might think is not and they could both be right i know of situations where both were right it's just a matter of opinion i've known situations where both are saying the same thing but they're saying it in different ways and they don't even know it and those are the areas where we have to work at the phrase agree to disagree first appeared in print in 1770 when at the death of George Whitfield, John Wesley wrote a memorial sermon which acknowledged and downplayed the two men's doctrinal differences. He came up with that phrase. Even though they had differences, he was able to write. There are many doctrines of a lesser nature. In these we may think and let think. We may agree to disagree, but meantime, let us hold fast to the essentials. And that is so true. There are so many things that are of lesser degree in our life, and especially when it, when it comes to how we do things. That sometimes is the issue with a lot of people. How are you doing it? I have, I've just learned that there are different ways of doing things. Uh, there was a time where a person said, why don't we turn the lights out on Wednesday? I'm like, why would we do that? Well, because we're worshiping and just make the, the, the ambient mood, you know, and just kind of write the spirit. I go, yeah, but then if the lights are out, people won't see the, the lights coming from the windows and see from the outside that, that, that we're here worshiping and they drive up, they won't want to come in, you know. And so the two different ways of doing something You know, and it just, I'm like, well, okay, we could try it. And it was like, yeah, let's keep doing it. I'm like, you know what? I just, I don't, I don't like it. And it was like a thorn in his side. We need to learn that there are things that don't really matter. Reproofs, corrections display a deep, uh, a deep and faithful relationships. They really do when we're able to receive reproofs and corrections. Proverbs 27, 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. How can we improve our relationship? Philippians 1.27 says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that whether I come and see you or an absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit 
with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice that he adds that word striving. First he says that you stand fast in one spirit and one mind. And then he says striving together for the faith. There's a striving that takes place. You know what strive, that means you're going to disagree agreeably. You're going to work through things and come up with the best. But when it's the faith of the gospel, you have to keep it. You have to keep the, the essentials clear. Paul said in Ephesians 4, 1, and I love this chapter. <clears throat> it's a good chapter to read on relationships. It really is. It's one that you should, you should probably read a lot and try to even memorize the whole chapter. But let me give you three verses. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all loneliness, lowliness, and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Very clear. <clears throat> Walking in lowliness. He uses three adjectives here. Lowliness. Literally, humiliation of mind. Modesty, humbleness of mind, humility taking that place jacob could have easily said esau bow down to me because dad said you had to i have the blessing so bow down to me <clears throat> and esau said but you stole it from me and the argument starts back up right <clears throat> no jacob took the humility and he bowed down to him that was very wise of him this seems to point to our attitude towards ourselves in our relationship with God and with those individuals. Then the gentleness that he spoke about implies the same idea of meekness, which is strength under control. Strength under control. That's what meekness really means. This is the attitude that we have towards God. We submit our lives in obedience to the precepts or the word of god even though we might desire to elevate ourselves <clears throat> so we're meek and then long suffering this carries the idea of being patient but also tolerant and forgiving patient tolerant and being forgiving and these are divine characteristics that we need to pray for in the power of the holy spirit we really need those things. We are to bear with one another, Paul said, in love. Carries with it the idea of patience with each other, <clears throat> frailties, and with our faults. Forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven us, Colossians tells us. Not winking at sin, I'm not talking about sin, but also not applying a haughty and vindictive attitude towards one another peter said this above all things have fervent 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 love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sin the secret to unity in our relationships begins with how we view ourselves within the body and how we view others it really does we shouldn't have a haughty spirit i, I am no different than you are i am a man just as you are a man. <clears throat> Pastor Dave was sharing with us yesterday. <clears throat> He's, you know, on CCA. He's one of the overseers of Calvary Chapel Association. And he made this, this point. He says, you, you know, we're all senior pastors here. And you know how we have to be shepherds of the flock. And that's a very difficult thing to do, he said. He says, can you now imagine me? I am now a shepherd of shepherds. That's even more difficult because he says, because you guys are all arrogant, you know, and he just started, <laughs> everyone starts laughing. You're worse than the sheep. <clears throat> but keeping that right perspective that we're all sinners, we all have responsibilities, we're all to be humbled. Philippians 2 3, Roman just went through it. Do nothing out of selfish ambitions or vain conceit. But in humility, consider one another better than yourselves. So Esau returns that day his own way. Jacob returns this way. They learn to agree disagreeably, and they go on in peace. 
Look at verse 18 through 20. Jacob move on into, into he moves on to Canaan, coming first to Shechem, which is was was the first stop of Abraham back in chapter 33, 18 through 20, <clears throat> where Abraham had built his altar, and he secured some property here. Verse 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, uh, when he came to Padamaram. And he pitched his tent before the city, and he brought the parcel, he bought a parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor. Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money, when he erected an altar there and called it El Elhohi Israel. So he crosses the Jordan, comes into the land there at last where God had directed him to go. Now, it's possible, and we really don't know, but it's possible that within that time of erecting the building and the tents and so forth and finding a home, that he did go and visit his brother Esau and Seir. They were close enough that he could of. So keeping that distance, but yet having that relationship with, with one another. But we really don't know. So he erects an altar, and he calls it God, the God of Israel. And this is the first time that Jacob has used the new name of God that, that had given him. So God, the God of Israel, he's talking about himself there. You are God, you are the God of me, Israel. <clears throat> that is a changed person who understands that God, you are my God, and I humbly follow you as you lead me. You rule over me. We see Jacob building this altar to the Lord just as his father and grandfather had done. Why did they build those altars? To sacrifice, to be reminded that they needed a savior, that the Messiah was coming. And that was something that they never wanted to forget, something that we should never forget, our Messiah. We should have an altar in a sense, a reminder what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It should never get old. It shouldn't be something that we think that we've heard it enough. I can't hear it enough that my Savior died on the cross for me, that he took my sins and my place. I, I love to think about all the things that he had done for me because he loved me and he loved us, that he was willing to take our place on that cross, that God himself in all his glory had no need of us, but yet he created us. And he loved us so much to not let us perish in our sins, but to literally come down and become a man like us. And he took our place on that cross so that we could have eternal life. That moves me. It blows me away. That tells me that I am so important to him, even though I don't feel that. I feel so ashamed at the things I've done, the things I have did, and the things even that I do. <clears throat> and yet he still loves me. There's no height, there's no depth, there's no width, no power, no principality that can ever separate me from the love of God or you from the love of God. That should move you to love him even deeper because he gave his life for us. And so that altar was a reminder of the Messiah, the Savior that would come and die for us. <clears throat> Jacob, he never once called the Lord my God. And now he says, my God, which speaks of that relationship that we, we have with God. So he calls it El Elohi Israel. God, the God of Israel. He's my God, by the way, just as he was Jacob's God, and he should be your God, and you should desire a relationship with him. And when you have that relationship, and I'm talking about with a relationship we just talked about, not just association, but loyalty and affection, that you are committed to him, and he is committed to you too, that changes your life. He loves you that much. 
And I hope you have that relationship with him. If you don't, you need to pray about having a deeper, committed relationship with Jesus Christ. You notice how Jacob is at total peace now. He's my God. I have enough. I have everything that I need. What more do I need? There's a place where God is enough and more than enough. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's a place where it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. God is enough. There's a time when you don't even care if your house is falling apart. God is enough. I have God. I have God. And my home is in the eternal state. And, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, go ahead, Nebuchadnezzar, send us into the fiery furnace. You know, if, if, if the Lord wants to take us, he'll take us. But if he doesn't, then he won't. But we're at peace with that because God's enough for us. And if we're gone through this fire, we'll be in the presence of the Lord. So what have you gained? Not much. What have we gained? Eternity. So we really shouldn't fear because God is enough for us. Our worries, our concerns <clears throat> should be cast aside because God is enough. There's a peace there. There really is a peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding when you have that deep relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> Every once in a while I think of Forrest and the story that they they tell us about him going into the backyard and just praying and singing out loud to the Lord. See, that's enough, and that was enough. And that's the relationship that God wants with every single one of us. He wants us to sing to him. He wants us to shout his holy name. And I can't wait to do that again once it gets a little warmer, though. I'm not going to go out when it's so cold. <laughs> to go out there, and I used to do that in, in my, my house we didn't have so much stuff. I'd go way in the backyard where it's really dark and I'd just start talking to the Lord, walking around, just singing, praising Him. You know, and that's reminded me when, when He told that story about Forrest, it reminded me of how I used to do that. I haven't done that in a while. And I'm ready to do that again. I just want to go back there and just do that. That's the relation. It brings that peace. <clears throat> We're at peace. So the last point, peace at peace with God, at peace with one another. Romans twelve seventeen says, Repay no evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The church is an amazing thing, isn't it? It is an amazing organism made up of people from all different nationalities and backgrounds and upbringings with traditions and ideas and philosophies and God takes these people and he brings them together into this relationship and there is a peace that is there I was sharing again I think it was this morning <clears throat> years ago I had a job in Corona it's a little mobile home park lady was complaining about her bill being too high so I spent a little extra time she was 80 years old she had one of these little walkers and she got her way down out there and I spent a little more time just checking it out uh, and I found out that she had a water leak and it was leaking on a, a a wire electrical wire which was causing it to short out which is causing the usage to speed up and so I told her just have the maintenance people correct that and you should be fine well, then we started talking. She was a Lutheran. She was a Christian most of her life. And we started talking about the Lord. Her husband was a Christian and, and so forth. And we just, right away, I believe she was from back east somewhere. And, and we just hit it off. Here was a 22-year-old and an 80-year-old talking about the Lord. And we just had the neatest time. And I think probably for a whole year, we would talk to one another. If I was in the area, I'd go take lunch, and we'd have lunch together. She'd invite me in, we'd sit at the table, and we'd just have lunch. We got so close that she started asking me questions about her finances, and, and then she says, could you hold on to the, all these stocks for me? And I started getting a little scared. I go, no, that should be the responsibility of your children, not me. She goes, well, thank you. Could you find out how much they're worth? And I said, sure, I can do that for you. you know, but it was getting that close. There was loyalty. There was emotions <clears throat> there. 
and there was a, a peace there. We're the, the church is an amazing thing. It really is when you think about it. <clears throat> these are realities, and these realities are true among us as a degree as well in this church here. We have different backgrounds, points of views, upbringings, and yet we're a church. Therefore, Jesus, Jesus really is our peace. This is why the New Testament talks so much about conflict and the need for peace. The church needs it. Listen to these admonitions that God gives us. Be at peace with one another, Mark 9, 5. Be at peace among yourselves, 1 Thessalonians 5, 13. Live in harmony with one another, Romans 12, 16. Pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding, Romans 14, 19. So peace is something that we have to work towards. We really do. We see the peace of Jacob in this situation and his brother very clearly. They were able to work it out. Though they're not like the, the most loyal to one another and emotionally connected, yet there's a peace there. We can live that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Let me close. <clears throat> Just a, a quick, quick sentence here. The, the truth that, Jacob, that kept Jacob going forward, I really believe this, was the promise of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think that really kept him going forward, that God was enough for him. And so he was able to, to, to restore that relationship with Esau and, and move him back to the promised land. God had given him this promise also, and we need to keep him in our sight at all times, no matter what the struggles, until he fulfills the promises that he promised us. He should be our center. He should be enough for us. And when he is, everything else will just fall into place with our relationships. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word and this beautiful picture, Father, that we have. <clears throat> My heart is, Lord, that uh, some of these relationships that have been broken, uh, Father, within Calvary Chapel, Lord, within churches, within families, Lord, can somehow be mended, Lord. And if not necessarily back to the place where they were, but just a, a peaceable love, a disagreement to disagree agreeably, Lord. One day, Lord, it will all be over. We'll be in heaven and we'll have that perfect love, that perfect understanding. And we'll know all things as he knows all things. And we won't have these struggles that we have. Unfortunately, Lord, we live in a fallen world. And we will always have these struggles. Help us, Lord, to take the position of humility, Lord. Even as Christ gave us that example, Lord. He went to the cross like a lamb to the slaughter. He said not a word, Lord. And he is our example, Father. Let us not stir things up, Lord, but let us learn to walk in unity. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. <clears throat> Men, the Forged Ministries on Saturday morning is meeting at 8 o'clock. So we've changed it from 6.30 to 8. So if you'd like to join us at 8 for a half an hour of prayer and then we'll just do a, a, a devo <clears throat> you're more than welcome to join us so it gives you a little bit more time to sleep in i know some of the guys are, i love to go but it's really early so uh, i'll be here at eight o'clock uh, this coming saturday if you'd like to join us god bless you we'll see you sunday be safe out there a lot of crazies this holiday season <laughs>